Hello, Julian. Hello, Mike. I hope nobody's listening to this. Well, if they are, they better not tell anyone, eh? <laughs> Especially as tonight, it's time for something completely different. That's right. We've got our first ever two-part podcast with our backers. And in this episode, we have half of the next episode. Confused? You won't be. Not after you've listened to tonight's episode of Fed Me Ramblings. Yeah. Hi, I'm Mike Brampton. And my name is Julian Ho. Welcome to Veterinary Ramblings. In this week's episode, we're talking to Helen MacDonald, who some of you will know as the owner of Geronimo the Alpaca. This is a controversial topic, and so we want to listen carefully to what Helen has to say. We've split the story into two parts. In this episode, you'll get to know the woman outside of the scandal. We hope you enjoy it and tune in to the next episode to learn about the specifics of what happened to Geronimo. So, on with the show. Uh, Mike, can I, can I ask the most important question that we're likely to ask tonight? Can I, can I ask that? You want to start the whole show with the most important question that we're going to ask tonight? Go well, on, possibly, then. arguably, arguably the most important. Arguably the so most Helen, important, and, and the one that everybody wants to know from our guest, Helen McDonald, this evening. Yep. Go on, then. What's your favourite bread, Helen? Bread. Bread. Uh, um, have to be soda bread. Oh, soda bread? Oh, yeah. Yes, can't go wrong with soda bread. Or well, naan good. bread, or pretty no, much no, no, any no, kind no, of bread. No, 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 you only like one. <laughs> yeah, but one well, also, you've, you've had three then as well, because naan is bread, but it's Indian for bread, isn't it? So, it's like bread bread. Bread bread. Bread. Bread, bread is good. But no, bread. naan is nice, naan is nice. Soda bread is lovely. Uh, the quickest <laughs> bread you can make, really, isn't it, soda bread? I've like, never made bread, actually. No, no. I've, I've never made it. I only learned to bake in lockdown. Right. So I'm doing quite well. I can bake a cake so now. Dead easy. <laughs> About 500 grams of flour. Uh, let's go for 320 mils of milk with uh, one lemon squashed into it. Uh, add uh, about a table, sorry, a teaspoon and a half of baking powder. Mix it all together. Stick it in the oven in there. So why why soda bread then, Helen? Is there a Welsh connection there? First thing that came into my head, to be honest, I think any kind of bread. <laughs> Momentarily blank there for a moment. So um, <laughs> we we uh, like to put people on the spot. <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah, bread is good. I pretty much eat any kind of bread. So I was wrong with the link with Wales, but would I be right in thinking there's a link with Australia? Yes, yes. So um, when I was seven, my parents emigrated uh, and we lived in Australia for seven and a half years. Did they came back? And then came back, yeah. Not my doing, but um, I came back <laughs> and um, oh, wow. I've been here ever since. Yeah. Where, where so, were you in Australia? Mainly Sydney, Love so that. the North Shore, just up the coast from Manly, where they film Home and Away. Really nice. Yeah. Couldn't wish for a better place to live. Especially growing up. I was going to say, so they let you, those, those formative development years from seven to 14, where you're establishing your social network and then said, we're going to go back to the UK. Yes, pretty much. Yeah, Dumped me in a village with no facilities in the middle of winter. <laughs> so. Have you, uh, this was obviously a few years ago, have you actually found it in yourself to forgive them? <laughs> Yeah, it was decades ago. I got over it. <laughs> You're probably the coolest person at your new school, weren't you? No, I was always the one that spoke differently to everybody else. So when I got there, I had an English accent. When I left and came back, I had an Australian accent. So I couldn't win, really. I did have a year off where we drove around Australia. And uh, that was nice. But I think I was about seven then. And uh, just, mm -hmm. yeah. Drove across Nullarbor and, yeah, just had a nice life. And then came back and knuckled down in a grammar school with needlework and cookery. Great. <laughs> which, you, which you actually hated, I think, because you didn't bake bread. 
No, I didn't. Um, I hated home economics, as they called it in those days. But, uh, yeah, I was used to doing woodwork and metalwork and technical drawing and proper subjects, you see, in Australia. And then I came back and had to do girl things. So. Yeah, it's, it's a very practical life in Australia, isn't it? Yeah, well, you're outside most of the time and we live near the beach, which was great. So I used to go ice skating that was down the road and we had horse riding half an hour away. So, yeah, I had a pretty busy social life as a, as a child, whizzing around doing all sorts of stuff. So, But not diving. I didn't learn to scuba dive until I came back to England and I learned in a swimming pool. <laughs> yeah. And so you love the freezing cold water of England, when you? Yeah. Yeah, middle, low visibility, lugging boat engines across beaches, doing it all the hard way in a dry suit, freezing weather. Very good diving in England, but a lot of effort, a lot of effort. Uh, uh, very good diving, very good. Yeah, Where, excellent. Whereabouts, whereabouts did you dive? I don't anymore because I knackered up my ears and turned out I had a bit of a heart problem all the time. But uh, we used to dive around the coast, so Plymouth, Salcombe, anywhere around the, the south coast. Oh, I, yeah. I learned to dive in Plymouth. Oh, okay. You do um, Edison Lighthouse? Yes, Edison Lighthouse on that one. Yeah, yeah, all around there. It's all murky. I dived on a submarine once and uh, at the M2 off Chesil. Yeah. Have you done that one? Yeah, I've that's done really that one, good. Yeah. The only problem with that one was the visibility was so bad. When I got to the bottom, I literally hit it before I could see it. And um, we were pretty much out of time and uh, we didn't stay down there very long. It's, uh, <laughs> it was, um, yeah, not very exciting. One of the nicest dives I did was um, you know, back in Australia, actually, but uh, on Heron Island, which was only in four metres of water. Mm -hmm. And just sat there for an hour and a half, watched turtles go by. I mean, it was just blissful. Oh. The Silly Isles is good diving. So this is good, isn't it? Yeah. Is it? Clear water, quite warm. Yeah, there's lots of seals and there's some mm. good cannon down on some of the wrecks. Uh, lots of weed uh, to swim through. But uh, yeah, so there's some nice diving around there. Uh, and I spent two weeks diving in Sardinia, which I absolutely loved. The visibility there is down to about 50 metres. You know, you can see it from the boat. It's, it's just brilliant for visibility. I didn't realise how deep we were diving because I'd only ever been in pea soup, you know. It's like, um... <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant Amazing. stuff. Mike used to be a snorkelling instructor. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Excellent. You can, do a, tanks of air. you can do an awful lot just snorkelling and I wouldn't go back to diving if I was physically able to. I wouldn't go back to diving now. Having done it, it was brilliant, but... It was for you know, younger folk, shall I say, um, and snorkelling. Yeah, if you, if you go somewhere nice, you can see just as much. I, I think sometimes you can see more because it's quieter with with, uh, with scuba diving. This is the bubbles going. Yeah, yeah. Mm. There's a lot of uh, problems with my ears in the end because it's just you know uh, various. Clear them. Yeah, just couldn't clear them. Um, and it was years later that I discovered I had a heart problem. Um, and I shouldn't probably have been diving at all there, but ever. Wow. <laughs> you know, I've had 300 dives under my belt. <laughs> sure. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, draw, draw a veil over that. Yeah. Well, you have to have chest x-rays for diving. So you have to have medically fit to dive, don't you? And, um, yes. and uh, my heart was always fine on the x-rays. It just started failing after, <laughs> after that. <laughs> <laughs> so so it, was okay. it was okay when it was stationary. It was just oh. when it was going lub -de lub -de lub -de lub -de that was when the exactly, problem. yeah, right. exactly, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> kind of important. yeah, kind of important, yeah. Mm. So, okay. what were your favorite subjects uh, at school in Australia, and, and did those subjects change when you got back to England? I think biology, uh, I like technical drawing, I like the practical stuff of it. Um, I can actually draw a bit, I don't anymore, but I, I did enjoy drawing, and then when I came back. Well, apart from the cookery and the needlework, I had a really lovely art teacher and um, I did well in art. I had to do um, English lit and English separately, which we didn't do in Australia. We didn't do any languages in Australia. So if you wanted to be an air hostess, you would learn Japanese or something. We had to do French compulsory at the school I went to. So I had to catch up three years on top of the year I was doing. And I ended up with a CSE, which I didn't work very well. 
<laughs> I'm not gifted at languages at all. So, yeah, I was stuck with the science subjects. So, très bon and CSE. That's about it, yeah. Très bon. <laughs> yeah. Très bon. <laughs> yeah. Très bon. So, liking the sciences then, moving on, is that what took you into veterinary nursing? So, I wanted to be a marine biologist and sit on the barrier reef and count starfish. Good idea. I was going to university, I had a place that, you know, to go and study zoology. And then I spent the summer at my local veterinary practice. I went for a week and I was there for the entire summer. And then you just have to drive me home because I'd missed the bus. So that was what turned it really. I thought, do you know what? I don't want another three years at uni for a desk job. Then I'm going to have to go and do further study to get anywhere in zoology with what I wanted to do. I knew quite a few people with zoology degrees that had not really used them. So Mm. vet nursing was practical. I loved it. Absolutely loved it. And um, I realised pretty soon I didn't want to be a vet. Um, I'd been a vet. I wanted to be a vet since I was about one. Mm. Oh, right. Okay. (laughs) Well, I always picked the brown teddy bears and (laughs) everything that was animally looking. Yeah, I decided actually nursing was what I wanted to do. So I started in the mixed practice when I was 19. Right. So you originally wanted to be a vet? Yes, everyone does, don't they? (laughs) No, I was going to be a fighter pilot. Oh, okay. Interesting switch. <laughs> but, 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 I, was, uh, I was going to be a vet, but also uh, a deep sea diver. Right, okay. Right, yeah. Bit scary right down the bottom, though, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, well, I fancy the Mariana Trench. I thought, you know, let's go down oh. there and just see if there are any animals there. That That's like funny that. because we've heard from one of our listeners called Brenda, who has also mentioned <laughs> you in reference to the Mariana Trench, Julian. Well, hey. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, and thanks for well, thank you very much for that, Brenda. That was excellent. I really, really enjoyed that. We'll see if we can get him down the Mariana Trench then, just yeah, for you. She, she wants me to go down the Mariana Trench and stay. Brenda's not our friend sometimes. <laughs> right. Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> no, you're better off back at the surface, I think. Okay. I think so. Okay. So, so this 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 desire to be a vet then. Yeah. Um, as long as you can remember? Um, yeah, I mean, there was. I was never allowed pets as a child. So I grew up in Australia, as I said, and we didn't live anywhere where we were going to be having pets. So I wanted a horse, as most people do as well. And um, I came back and I was like, how do I get animals? I could, you know, my parents were just like, don't need animals. They were they hadn't grown up with animals themselves. And so right. I, persuaded, um, I persuaded my mum to let me have a guinea pig. And uh, my sister was also had to have a guinea pig and I made sure one was male and one was female and so we ended up with 13 guinea pigs and we kept them all and I was very Mm -hmm. happy because I had more animals but yeah we didn't actually get a cat until I was I think it was something like 1994 I'd been in practice for two or three years and this poor little kitten came in it was about three weeks old diarrhea, closed eyes. Someone found it in their garden, apparently. And I took it home, having squared it with my mum and said, look, said to my sister, this cat doesn't belong to us. I'm just bringing it home for some intensive care and thinking it was, you know, it could have could have died, poor thing. I mean, it was in a right state. I brought him home and a week later, he was climbing out of his cat basket and bursting his hot water bottles and things. And I said, oh, he's much, much better, isn't he? And I said, by the way, you can keep him. And uh, that was our first cat. So. All right. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Great. Brilliant stuff. And I still don't have I'm a still, dog. <laughs> I'm still I, waiting I was to get I was just about to say, so, so when did it progress then? So, so. And so you went then from wanting <laughs> just to be a vet to wanting desperately to sit on a coral reef counting starfish. Yes. And then thought, no, sod this for a game of soldiers. Veterinary nursing is what I really want to do. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. And did you then, but you'd already seen practice at, at a vet at that time. Uh, yes, by the time I decided to be a vet nurse, I had um, I actually persuaded my local surgery to let me go one Saturday morning when I was about 14. And I nagged this poor chap absolutely blind and he said oh fuck god say all right you can come from like nine till twelve and, and off I went I got to see um 
a post-mortem of a Cavalier King Charles. And I realised gallbladders were green. That was massively exciting. <laughs> and then uh, we went out to, to uh, drench a cow that would have milk fever. I, I can't remember what else I saw that morning, but it was just the best three hours ever. And then so mm -hmm. when I was 16, I went off to work experience. And as I said, I spent the whole summer there. And that was mixed practice. So I was out on horse visits and in the cars and doing just all sorts, counting 100 pednisolone tablets and putting them in a little envelope, um, as you had to do in those days. <laughs> well, that's, that's what we used to get the work experience kids to do there, yeah. wasn't it? Here, yeah. Here, here's some Here's some sites of the toxic drugs. Go and count them. <laughs> yep. Making up um, foot dressings for yeah. cow's feet and all sorts of stuff. Yeah. yeah. Those were the days. Those were the days. Uh, yeah. didn't, didn't have drugs in those days, did we? <laughs> no, no health and safety, certainly. Yeah, that's right. So, uh, so yeah, so that was that was it then, really. And I couldn't get, so I couldn't stay away. And that's what did it, really. And, um, yeah, that practice, I was doing all sorts of different things and just getting stuck in. And so, yeah, so when I finished my A-levels, I went and got a job in a practice. I was there for four years. And then um, I used to do a small animal, but being mixed, I used to volunteer to go out on cow cesareans and stuff like that and help out mm -hmm. with anything that was out of hours. And then I left there to go and teach vet nursing, which I did for nearly two years okay. uh, at college. And But I missed practice. Uh, so I had only been qualified to, um, two and a half, well, only about a year, I think, by the time I went to teaching. Mm -hmm. I was the first of the multiple choice examinations and the green book. Oh, that, oh, that green book. I'm that old, yeah. <laughs> that green book. So now, now our listeners, our listeners don't know the uh, the green book. The yeah. The same green book of veterinary nursing. Do you, want to, do you want to tell us a bit about that? Yeah, that was uh, that was fun. But uh, yeah, so I went back into practice, uh, small animal practice as head nurse, then in a practice for two years. And then I went locoming for two years and lived out of my car, which was also great. You lived out of your car? Pretty much. Well, they, they always gave me really nice houses to live in. But um, I literally went from one job to another and I was never out of work. There was always so much to do. And I went all across the south south of England. Right. Locomy here, there and everywhere. And I went to one practice where they had a group of six practices, actually. And I went there for a week and I was there for 11 months because I went, <laughs> just kept going, covering all their practices. And then I opened a new practice for mm -hmm. one of the partners uh, for six months, which was really, really good because it was my little baby. Right. And uh, yeah, so I've done loads of exciting things with my qualifications, and uh, yeah, yeah it's been, uh, been really good. So, 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 what made you? What made you want to locum? I just got a bit stuck in a rut. I'd been studying for my surgical diploma, and um, I just got to the point where I thought, actually, do you know what? <laughs> this, this, this is this is not living. Um, so I, yeah, I just thought, well, I'm going to take some time out. I'd always had a job. And uh, off I went. And yeah, the locoming was brilliant. I had I had mm -hmm. amazing jobs, uh, met some really wonderful people uh, and worked really hard. Um, I never had a, I don't think I had a day off in two years. And then the only reason I gave up locoming actually was because I wanted to buy a house. And uh, right. I bought a house and it was a new build. Um, it was a millennium house and uh, I didn't want anyone else to live in it. <laughs> Oh, well, I, be I better stay put then and um, and find a job. So <laughs> protecting your fortress. Mm. Mm. So that led me full circle back to the practice that I originally did my work experience in. That was the practice, the one the the, the it originally made yeah. you decide to become a vet nurse. Yeah, yeah. And how long um, were you there for? Ten years. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> yeah. I didn't leave there till, so I, I joined in, I think, the March 2000. I think I left in the April 2010. And uh, mm -hmm. I had been head nurse and then practice manager for the last five and trained uh, quite a few nurses, did a lot of portfolios, and uh, I loved mm -hmm. it. Uh, but I I was training nurses who were less than half my age, and I thought, <laughs> <laughs> it's time to do something different <laughs> and you. so I said right I'm gonna go and see what else is out there to do and uh, I ended up in industry 
uh, Helen, no. the, these these rugged good looks and and the lack of hair and that 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 doesn't it's it's not makeup. No, <laughs> it's real. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. real, isn't it? Yeah. yeah this, uh, this, this isn't about me. This is about you. So, <laughs> so, yeah. so after, after how many years? 20 years nursing? Yep. 20 years nursing. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. A long old time. Well, oh, really? nearly. Yeah. I think it was. And then you went yeah. to the industry repping? Yeah. So I went off and sold x ray machines just for, just for a change of scene. <laughs> So, okay. so I worked for an x-ray company for three years and um, I had a, a suddenly got went from a mad hectic practice with, you know, seven vets, 15 nurses, a hospital, night shift, the whole lot, running all of that, uh, out into a car with a phone driving around the southwest of England. A uh, bit of a culture shock, but yeah. I actually loved it. It was, yeah. it was really good. It's very different. I had, everything happens really slowly when you're outside of a practice and you will got you will know this <laughs> you're yep. not making those those 30 second five second decisions all the time where you're constantly assessing what's going on around you but then you get in a car and you're like going down the m5 okay what do i do now <laughs> um it's really different yeah really different but but again great i i met so many lovely people i've been in pretty much every practice in the southwest of england yeah, yeah. So why, why necessarily X-ray equipment? Was that just where the job was? Or it it was, think, yeah, it was, it was um, something that I liked the idea of. I was, uh, I didn't understand radiography until I had to teach it. Um, so when mm. I did my nursing, I was I, I answered all the questions, but I could not tell you that I actually understood it. Um, and then when I had to teach it, suddenly all the everything. Yeah, all of the atoms and whatnot all clicked. And I thought, like, okay, I, I actually do understand this now. Um, but X-ray just happened to come up. And I was like, I like the idea of of come out of equipment right. as, a, as opposed to tablets. Uh, and so <laughs> we, yeah, I used to go out with the engineers and install things and fix things. And yeah, and the, the imaging and the, you know, what we were seeing on images and stuff was also fascinating because it is clinical as what we were doing. And I spent years x-raying animals. So I knew, you know, what I was looking at, which was helpful. So yeah, I really enjoyed that. After three years, the veterinary side of the business went. And so I was off to pastures new. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went and worked for a large corporate group opening practices. So so that was also good. Uh, it was challenging. Uh, there was lots going on. But mm. I used to literally start with an empty shell of a building and fill it with the with the vet that was going to be running it. So uh, wow. or owning it um, even. So yeah, that was again another. I think it was a year or so I was doing that. But I was away from home a lot, mm. and it was every other week I was away. And, and this so, was the lovely new home that you didn't want anyone else to live in. Yeah. So, yeah. So you I can see how that wouldn't have been good. Back in my car again, and I'd be gone from Monday to Friday. And, and then it got to the point where I thought, well, you know, I can't do this. And the, the alpacas were multiplying and I was just getting phone calls. Oh, Fluffy's had a, had a boy this morning or whatever. <laughs> I wasn't at home. So it was, uh, um, but it, it worked. Um, mm. Yeah. And I really enjoyed that too. So uh, it, just having, Having the skills and being able to go out and do different things, is, it's just been, you know, been amazing. We interrupt the show for an important announcement. Hi there, dedicated listeners. We just wanted to take a little time outside of the show as we've got something very exciting to share with you. We have exclusive Veterinary Ramblings merchandise available now, including T-shirts, mugs, posters and prints. Now, personally, I think my favourite is our T-shirt with a hilarious diagram of cat anatomy, yep. which has been revised to include their sandpaper tongue and treat-detecting ears. And essential for all veterinary students. If you would like to show your support for the show, head over to veterinaryramblings.com and select either the merch button for a one-off purchase through our T-Mill store or select Become a Patron. I'm sure you'll be absolutely chuffed to know that everything on our t-mail store is fully sustainable carbon neutral and shipped in plastic free packaging 
By making a one-off purchase, you will help us to plant more trees, save water and reduce carbon emissions. If you want to further support us, become a Patreon and receive items you cannot get through one-off purchasing. A shout out on the show and exclusive Veterinary Ramblings content. Every single purchase made will really help us keep on interviewing amazing guests. But if nothing else, we do appreciate you tuning in. Now, now on, on with the, the show. show. So the alpacas were already a part of your life at this point then? Yeah, you, you kind of slipped that in, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> the alpacas came in onto the scene in 2002. So... When I was still in my my ten year head nurse job, I wanted something else. Oh, hang on, I know the story. And this little alpaca came in, and it got closed eyes and, and wasn't diarrhea. Really good. And <laughs> diarrhea. And, yeah. Not quite. No, not okay. quite. Okay, sorry. Right. Okay. okay. Right. Not quite. So um, I was looking. I thought I'm either going to buy a horse and chuck fifty pound notes in the ground. Um, or I'm going to look and see if there's something I can do outside of work that involves the outdoors and animals. Because, I mean, it had to be animal motivated. So off I went to the Bath and West Show. Now, 2002 was the back end of foot and mouth. So there was horror going on around that time. And I went to the Bath and West and it was Mm -hmm. tipping it down with rain. There was mud everywhere. No animals, obviously, because of the situation and I was just wandering around in the mud <laughs> and I saw a picture of an alpaca and I, I said oh, why have you got a picture of an alpaca there and they said oh, well we have them in England I said you're kidding me and I'd seen them in Australia when I was yep. about eight years old mm-hmm. and uh, I thought oh my god alpacas so I didn't know much about them so I did some lots of picking of brains and I did have they plied me with wine which I blame to this day for the reason that I ended up with some but um it was another (laughs) it was another six months before I actually actually looked to buy some so I did loads of research I went and visited farms I read all the books I could find and I went and spoke to people um, around the world and whatnot and then I decided I would get some so so I I got three, and two of them were pregnant. So that was my my little herd. So I brought five home, um, mm-hmm. and yeah, the rest, as they say, is history. That was twenty years ago now. So yeah. And did, um, did you get them with a with a plan in mind? Did you think I'll just get three random, varying coloured alpacas, and they'll keep the grass down? Or did you think? I want to breed alpacas and I want to be a breeder of a specific colour or strain of alpacas. I wanted to be a breeder. Um, Mm -hmm. So I knew I wanted to breed them um, because I thought one day, you know, they might help subsidise my vet nurse wages. And I didn't really know what colours I wanted. I knew what breed I wanted. Um, And I thought, right, I actually want a white one, a brown one and a black one. And I couldn't find a black one initially and originally I actually went back to the the original people that I'd first spoken to uh but I'd been out to see other farms I kept getting offered white ones just white ones and then they they had boy babies at foot and I didn't want those either I said I just want three pregnant females because they're not cheap or they weren't cheap in those days they weren't cheap at all and so I ended up getting what I want they were different ages and they were different very different animals and I thought, right, well, this will get me started and I can see what I like. And then the first baby came out and the mum was brown and the dad was white. Mm-hmm. And we got a black baby. <laughs> so okay. I thought, hey, this is good. We've got a black one. Um, and that really set me on black. So I like black ones. Uh, the quality of the black ones was in those days was pretty awful. They looked like llamas, most of them. And they were they were quite poor quality because the in South America, the Peruvian government had said to their growers, we want you to make big white ones so we can lots of fiber, dye it any color, good on the world market. And they mm-hmm. made way with the white ones by killing a lot of the colored ones. And the genetics uh, were mostly then in Chile. So 
there was just a bit of a mis mismatch. And so the black one that I bought was not a sterling specimen, uh, but she was brilliant. And she taught me so much about alpacas and how to treat them and what they like and what they don't like. And she was scared witless when she turned up. Yeah, she taught me that I didn't have to, you know, do the whole grab around the neck and hang on tight malarkey to, to check her feet. I could just actually ask her to pick her foot up and she'd do it. And, and so she was just amazing. I learned so much about, in those days, it was a big sheep and you grabbed it whichever way you could and hold, held on. And that was just so, I just thought, this got to be a better way. And yeah. so, yeah, we yeah. Uh, we learned a lot. Yeah. I, uh, at, at about that time, I know it was earlier than that. So 1994, it's quite a bit earlier, I was seeing practice at uh, Chessington Zoo. Oh, when right, was, yeah. When it was still a zoo. Uh, over one summer and one of my jobs was to treat the guanacos for lice okay and we had, i think it must have been alludex really not just careful it's <gasps> awful <laughs> stuff yeah i remember <laughs> and, and, and we, had, we, had a, we had a gallon bucket of it and the idea was that, that uh, one of us would stand astride the guanaco <gasps> pin it down while you know, with, with they're these, quite um, big though <laughs> yeah with these car wash gloves and <laughs> dipping my hand in the bucket and then using these car wash gloves to wipe it all over with this really poisonous uh, uh yeah. yeah so but but because they bite and spit <laughs> the other two keepers would one of them would, would get a bag over the guanaco's head and the other one would get a lasso to hold the bag on hold that in place and i'd then jump on so we did that, uh, and we we're quite well for the first one. Bag over the head, and when you get a bag over the head, they go down onto their knees with, with guanacos. And so they did that, and then the other one got a, got a lasso over its head, and I got on, wiped the uh, alley decks over, and then the second one, bag over the head, lasso on. I jumped on, lasso off, bag off, and it jumped up and ran and knocked me off onto a tree, and. <laughs> On a, a branch of which I hung for the next 10 minutes. Oh, God. <laughs> if someone had said then, what you want to do is get a pet alpaca, I'd have grouped them all together and said, no, I mm. think not. Mm. Because that was before alpacas were really seen in the country, wasn't it? And then, then they yeah. started, I suppose, in the mid to late 90s yeah. to, to be brought in, really as, as walking pets, weren't they? Yeah, well, originally, so yeah, the, the llamas were about, and the llamas were the thing, and people had one or two llamas around, and then the alpacas came, and they first off uh, started, I think the first ones were bought from zoos in the UK, and then the jumbo jet ones were coming in um, from Peru when the government changed the law, so there was jumbo jet falls coming over, um, I think the first two jumbo jet ones were sort of the foundation animals and then mm. yeah then people started to buy them i mean they were silly money in those days because they were just new and mm. there were people with um la lots of land that would buy these and try and work out what to do with them yeah that, that was it was it we got one what do we do now how do we monetize they're there <laughs> should we make them <laughs> multiply and it was like <laughs> why um so and by the time I came into it, I think there in 2002, there was 12,000 alpacas, which still wasn't a lot when you compare it to sheep or cattle. Right. Mm. And um, and they were mainly living on estates uh, with rich people. <laughs> to be perfectly honest with you, I think I was the youngest alpaca purchaser around in those days. And I think I was, uh, how old was I? 32 or something. Um, and uh yeah they were well okay well we've got to breed them all up make their fiber better because the ones the original ones they they looked a bit you know uh not very fluffy um shall we say and so it's always been about improving the the shape of the animal and the quality of the animal for the mm -hmm. fiber but yeah there was all of these alpacas wandering around and and yeah people really didn't know much, but we learned really quickly. <laughs> I think um, we know so much more about them now than we ever did, uh, which is great. And we have, there's so many enthusiastic people about them. And I think when you've met one, it's a nice one. Um, it's, it's hard not to think, oh, you know, actually they're pretty amazing. 
I, I need to ask because alpaca wool is is quite famous. It's it can be like well, it should be like cashmere. So it can be really high quality, uh, and it every it's getting better all the time. So uh, there's bits of alpaca that the blanket is is the best quality, and the younger the animal, the better the quality is. So the first fleece is always finer than subsequent fleeces, generally speaking. Right. Um, Sorry, excuse my ignorance. The blanket, uh, the the saddle bit. So the bit on the back and right. the sides is the right. the bit of the animal that's got the best fiber on it. And then you've got the neck, which is usually good, but shorter, so that you can't use that in the same batch of, of yarn, for example, because it would fall out of the machine when you're spinning it. And then the the sort of the third, the coarser stuff is the legs and the belly around mm-hmm. the bottom. Uh, and that can be used as well, but you wouldn't necessarily put it in your finest yarn. So, um, so there's various grades, and then you've got the twelve different color groups and all the shades in between. So they go from black to white, browns, fawns, and greys, and then rose greys and silver greys and spotty greys and all sorts of other things that come yeah. out now. And then you've got the so say the different greys and what you're going to use it for. So it, it's it. Each animal is going to give you something, but it's uh, you need a lot of the same if you're going to make like a big batch of it. So. So what 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 what's what else are they used for then? Well, nowadays they're used for walking. Um, I think the trekking side of it's really taken off, especially during lockdown um, when people were mm. looking for something to do and go outside and be safe. Not not during actual lockdown, but um, yeah. but when they could they could go and visit farms. People want a nice thing to do, and they can literally go and take an alpaca for a walk. And depending on where the farm is, you can go to some amazing locations and take one for a walk you can't put anything on their backs they're not designed to carry anything but some people uh, will offer experience days you can go and spend a day or half a day with some alpacas and feed them and spend time with them and have a cream tea with them so there's that and then there's people doing yoga with alpacas now um which is which is quite yoga. cool yeah they literally do yoga in a field with alpacas sat around um I haven't tried oh, it myself. The alpacas, they do downward dog and you know, watch me uh, look at my neck. I think they just sit there and go, what are they doing? <laughs> <laughs> but they're very calming, you see. It's so crazy. it's best to help you with your your whole calming thing. So just to be in the presence of an alpaca then? Yeah. Oh. They're definitely stress busters for sure. I, I mm. could come home and spend five minutes, just watch them chewing the card or eating hay or something. It's it's a bit like any grazing animal, really. They are relaxing, but they don't they don't smell and they don't make huge amounts of noise. And they're just really cute. And they'll just come and sit next to you and hang out. And they don't want much. They just want to, you know, they're very social, gentle animals. And, uh, yeah, mm. stress busters, massive. I couldn't have got through the last few years without being able to go and sit with them. Um, yeah, really good. So there's no, there's no, uh, no meat or milk market for them. I, I'm glad he said it because it makes him look bad. Because I, I was going down the line of I had lamb tonight, and and sheep, of course, are known for their wool. But um, I had a very nice piece of lamb tonight. So there's no meat market for uh, for our. Pack oh, milk. meat market. Um, yeah. there is in Peru. Obviously, they live on them. Uh, they, you know, mm. they use everything, and yeah. they put their best ones under there uh, as offerings to the gods. So um, their highest quality alpacas usually end up under the floorboards. Wow. But um, yeah, so th- but they use every bit. Hmm. In the UK, there are a few people that will send alpacas for meat. And um, the majority of the alpaca owning population just finds this absolutely horrific. Mm-hmm. The, the ones that seem to go to the meat are the ones that aren't wanted, have behavioral problems, perhaps, and generally uh, it's an outlet for them Mm -hmm. most people will keep alpacas and they live for about 20 years and they'll keep them until they you know they have to be put to sleep or they die and they love them as members of their family so Mm -hmm. it's it's a very wide spectrum of why people own alpacas but generally speaking they're not eaten no they will they will 
be kept at home and they will be put to sleep when the, the time is right. Mm. Um, so it, it depends. If you say llama to an alpaca owner or you say meat to an alpaca owner, you probably won't go down very well, generally speaking. <laughs> yes, yeah, 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 exactly. I have eaten camel before in, in, in Arabia. I don't know whether it was a bad cut of camel, but it was rough old stuff. And so... I'm quite glad that alpacas are kept just for wool in this country because... And walking and yoga. Wool, walking and yoga, absolutely. Because it means that we can look at them without any ulterior motive other than these are lovely animals and they're soft and they're cuddly. And that's what we want, isn't it, from uh, from something that looks... It looks incredibly cute, doesn't it? The, your, your average la- uh, alpaca looks a little like a young Roger Waters in the live in Pompeii. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and, and that, that's how alpacas, we, we've got some alpacas down the road from us, very good farm actually. And they're lovely. We, we, it's very calming walking through the, uh, through the field or next to the field with them in. And they all sort of look at you. They are, yeah, exactly. They stare. Bug eyes. They stare, mm. they don't blink, they just stare at you. They can be yes. quite intimidating. Horse owners find them a bit intimidating when they first meet them. It's like, oh, why is he staring at me? Um, well, he's nosy, you know, <laughs> he wants to see what you're doing. Um, but yeah, they are they're very inquisitive and very intelligent. Uh, but, um, but yeah, they, they do just sit at the field, um, roll around a bit from time to time, sunbathe when the weather's nice, um, eat the hedgerows. Yeah, and just amuse themselves, really. Uh, they're quite and, and increase the biodiversity of this uh, of this country. Yeah, absolutely. And you know that they they graze differently to other animals. Uh, so they leave right. the toilet. They won't eat where the toilet areas are. Right. So you end up with these bright green circles where they he and who, and then the rest of the, the field is barren if it's not if it's overgrazed. It's just sort of very strange. <laughs> pattern of, of yeah. grazing um but yeah they they just they get bored you know they, they want stuff to do they like to roam around they like things to see and fields to change you know move around and whatnot so they're just they're just very gentle and very easy on the eye and they don't they do need maintenance of course they do they're a livestock animal but we yeah. only we don't mess with their fleece we don't brush them or wash them or do they just look after themselves in that respect and we trim their toes and we vaccinate and worm them as required on depending on fecal testing um and then they're shorn once once a year which takes about 10 minutes so right. do you do you shear them not myself no no i have shearing experts come and do it for me uh, Right. I um I run around with the nail trimmers and um, and pick up the fleece that hits the floor and take the the best bits of the fleece away. It's it's very much a team effort. You need two people to put the animal on the floor. We, we mm. you can put them on tables, but we put ours on the floor. And you have the shearer and then the head holder who will do the shearing, and they're tied mm-hmm. out um, so that they don't injure anybody um, or themselves. And then you have a, someone with a broom sweeping up and you have someone taking the fleece and then check the teeth and check their toes whilst they're on the floor. And then um, they get up and wander off and then look at their friends and go, why are you naked? And I'm not. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> I bet you're cold. That's quite yeah. funny, yeah. That's like my last visit to the hairdressers, that. I don't know, yeah. yeah. They do that anyway, they'd like that. Yeah. Yeah. And do you, do you spin the wool yourself? Or? I don't do any spinning, no. I, I I want to, uh, but timing, you know, I spend most of my time with the animals. And uh, what I do do, though, is make sure that it, every single bit gets used. So we sell all our good. First of all, the fleece comes off and we mm-hmm. skirt it. So we take all the tatty bits off and the fluffy, all the second cups and the bits of hay and straw that are stuck in it, clean it up and put it uh, in a bag. And we weigh it uh, for our own data management. And then um, my fibre goes to uh, a company in Devon who turn it into yarn. And the all the thirds, the sort of tatty bits, the short bits, the thick bits, the coarse spiky bits, they go off and make pillows and duvets to a company in Nottingham. All right. Mm. Yeah, so it all gets used and you can use it for all sorts of different purposes, but we try and make sure that all ours is used and it's done in England. I have sent yarn off myself, batched it and sent it off to commercial spinners 
and then sent it on to weavers. So we do have mm -hmm. a really nice collection of very lightweight, high quality scarves and things that we've done in the past. So that's something that I will take up again in the future. But um, it, it is, a, you, you mentioned it was like cashmere and it is absolutely wonderful. We've got a, a couple of um, jumpers and things. We've got the girls, my, my, my daughters when they were younger. Uh, and when they grew out of them, we were very upset because we, we wanted to keep them. They're lovely. But I, I, I only mentioned that because in contradistinction, I have this uh, shawl behind me, which a friend gave me, which is made of yak wool. And that has to be the most uncomfortable, wiry, <laughs> icky, yes. awful demon <laughs> wool ever. Yeah. And so I'm quite glad you keep alpacas rather than yaks. Um, yes, but it does. It does have. It does have. It's rather a fetching sort of pitch black color, which um, I, I know you 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 really wanted to get, didn't you? You you, you mentioned the black. Uh, yes. So all the color. So the majority of alpacas around the world are white because you can dye it any color. So that's that's always handy. But the the UK, because we kept the option of getting colored animals in, there's definitely, and we read up the quality of the color. So you don't need to dye yeah. it. So we've got you know, jet black fleece um, that is as black as it comes. Um, there's different shades of black, but if you've got the like a reddish black and a bluish black and so it just means you don't have to dye it and it is black and it, it's a it's a really nice um natural fiber to work with so what you were saying about the yaks with the spiky um mm. that is probably because those fibers are as thick as whatever so they're probably like over 100 micron wide and that's what makes them prickly. But the alpaca that's less than 30 micron won't itch and prickle your skin. So you know when people say, oh, I can't wear wool, it makes me itch. That's what that is. It's the, the micron of the individual fibre. So we're looking to breed mm. everything sub 30 micron, right. which we do. Yeah, because that affects the stiffness. And it's the stiffness that causes the, uh, yeah. the bristle effect. The yeah, and the primary fibres. As, as anyone you, with a beard would know, wouldn't you, Mike? Yeah, exactly. And the primary and secondary fibres as well. So we don't want thick primary fibres sticking out of them because that's prickly too. So you've got to get rid of that. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Mike, Mike's now waxing his beard just to soften. <laughs> you, you have a you, you gorgeous picture behind you, Helen, of, of a jet black alpaca. And we can scarcely make out the detail because it really is jet black against a black background. And he's on a blackboard. And that's, yeah. um, that's Geronimo. That's Geronimo. That was drawn do, for do me. Can you tell us a little bit about Geronimo? Yeah, that picture that was drawn for me by a farmer last year who sent it to me um, just arrived in the post with a message on it. But um, yeah, Geronimo, Geronimo was amazing. Um, very happy, cheeky, by the end, very fat alpaca. <laughs> um, and uh, he came from New Zealand and uh, to improve the genetics in my herd, we don't have his genetics in the UK. And uh, that was, he was coming over to make a difference. And uh, he did, but not in the way that um, that we wanted him to. No. So, um, yeah, he is a very happy, outgoing, cheeky boy, which I think is why so many people just totally fell in love with him. He had, he had a good name, um, which helped, but he's just um, a very, yeah, a very special alpaca. Did he come with the name? He was named um, by the breeder in New Zealand after the song. There's a song called Say Geronimo. And uh, he was born on Waitangi Day, um, which is the New Zealand National Day. So mm -hmm. he, he was, um, yeah, he was special to them too. Well, all yeah. black. All black born on New Zealand Day. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah. So I picked him out um, with another with another one and right. uh, they came to uh the uk in august 2017 now or five years ago right mm. but but then then things didn't go very well oh, then, then things then, then things just went spectacularly wrong um mm. and what should have been a very 
relatively straightforward series of conversations and careful monitoring and research turned into a four-year fiasco dragging in courts and the whole myriad of what went on is just just it's still fun it's shocking 